So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, our keynote speaker, who's Dr. Marian Nessel, uh, again, uh, from uh, New York University. Um, and she is a consumer activist, a malnutritionist, um, award-winning author, academic, uh, who specializes in the politics of food and dietary choice. Uh, her research examines scientific, economic, and social influences on food choice and obesity, with an emphasis on the role of food marketing. Her books explore issues like the effects of food production on food safety, our environment, access to food and nutrition. She's also a very well-known author. Many of you, I'm sure, know her books, uh, Classic Food Politics, How the Food Industry Influences Nutrition and Health, and Safe Food, The Politics of Food Safety. Um, she's currently the Paulette Goddard Professor in the Department of Nutrition, Food Sciences, and Public Health, and Professor of Sociology at NYU. And she's received many awards and honors, um, including the 2011 uh, Public Health Hero Award from UC Berkeley School of Public Health, and um, and also um, is an, was an alumni of the year of the SPH in 2004, um, and also has been involved in a number of movies that many of you might have seen, like documentaries, Super Size Me, Food Fight, etc. So it was a real coup to have her here with us today. <laughs> so we're very happy to have her, and I'd like to, with no further ado, invite Mary Nessel to the podium. Thanks for the really nice introduction, and you didn't mention that I'm a Berkeley grad three times, so all of my degrees come from Berkeley, and it's very, very nice to be back here. In fact, it's thrilling to be back here. I just love it. Um, I w was really pleased to be asked to address you uh, about this, and this is such an exciting time to be talking about global public health nutrition issues because yesterday Mexico's lower house uh, passed a tax increase that includes a one peso tax on soft drinks. And this is the, f all it has to do now is pass the Senate, um, which may or may not be easy because, as they, this article put it, the lobbying effort in Mexico is like something they've never seen before. And I was in Mexico City a couple of weeks ago, and I got to see the lobbying uh, efforts in action, and they're really impressive. They're pulling out all stops. But this is really the beginning of what I see as a transformation of um, the global public health nutrition issues, especially as uh, they relate to obesity, and that's what I'm going to be talking about in this talk. But that's not all the good news. There's more good news, because also yesterday, uh, New York State Supreme Court agreed to hear uh, an appeal on Mayor Bloomberg's soda cap. Uh, proposal that has been strongly opposed by the soda industry, and so the soda cap is still in play. Um, so lots of good things are happening, and that was just yesterday. There'll be more. <laughs> There'll be more. So I approach all this from the standpoint of somebody who thinks about these things in a systems perspective, and by food systems I mean agriculture to public health, uh, when I was first studying nutrition, it never occurred to me that agriculture had anything to do with what people eat. Um, and it, I was kind of late in figuring this out. But I now think that you can't understand anything about what people eat unless you understand how the agricultural production system works. And you really can't understand agriculture unless you understand public health. So all of these things are very tightly integrated, and I don't really see any separation between them. And the most important global food system issues are... Um, really big ones, and they include, on the one hand, food insecurity, not enough food, on the opposite, obesity meaning too much food, and what joins food insecurity and obesity together is their causes and the way that you do something about them, whether you take personal or societal approaches uh, for trying to deal with them, and that's what I'm going to be talking about in this talk. Let me start with food insecurity. Um, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations just came out with its good news, which is that only 842 million in the people are suffer uh, people in the world are suffering from chronic hunger. That's a decrease of 26 million since 2012 by their counts, um, and that's good news. It still leaves us with nearly a billion people who don't have. Uh, 
who can't count on access to food on a daily basis, and that's a big problem for a lot of countries. Now, we know how to fix world hunger. It's not that complicated, and it requires a food systems approach that involves things like breastfeeding and making sure that people have clean water supplies and educating and empowering women, um, promoting sustainable agriculture, doing something about income inequity um, and stable political systems. That's all it's required. Um, but <laughs> what's important about these is that these are social uh, solutions to a problem. Um, they're not technological. They require changing society and doing something um, on a social and political and economic level to try to arrange for income equity, for example. Um, and so keep that in mind. Now, um, the in 1990, now a very long time ago, UNICEF developed a framework for the causes of malnutrition that emphasizes the need for social and societal approaches to this. And what UNICEF did in this framework, which um, I think is greatly ignored and needs a lot more attention, and everybody should pay attention to this, is it divided uh, the causes of malnutrition into immediate underlying and basic, and those of you who are trained in public health, basic causes or root causes. The personal, or in public health terms, downstream causes of malnutrition are not having enough food or being sick, but much more important are the social or upstream causes, which have to do with political resources, the economic structure, the ideology of the country, um, education, uh, health care, and those kinds of social structures that promote good health. So keep that in mind. Um, in the United States, uh, we have a, a food insecurity, and food insecurity has peaked or, or got or increased quite rapidly in 2008 when the economy suffered a decline. And the Department of Agriculture uh, estimates that there are 21 percent of the population are food insecure, which which seems like a lot. Um, and that 10 percent of those are, are children, and there are 1 percent of children are at very low food insecurity, which, or very low food security, which means that they're at risk of chronic hunger and the diseases that go with it. Food insecurity correlates with low income, with minority status, and with being overweight or obese, paradoxically, and it's that paradox that I want to say something about, or as the New York Times put it, in the obesity epidemic, poverty is the ignored contagion, and it's the common factor between obesity and food insecurity. Um, so these are the two faces of malnutrition. It's not just that way in the United States, it's also globally where David Stukler and I last year uh, wrote an article in which we talked about the two faces of malnutrition, um, a billion hungry people, two billion people obese. Um, I don't know how accurate those figures are, but they're rough figures. And underlying both is a food system that's driven to maximize profits rather than maximizing public health. So let's talk about obesity. Um, in the United States, where we have pretty good data on overweight and obesity, uh, the percentage of people in the population who are diagnosed with obesity increased from 1980 to 2008 from 15 to 34%. Um, it's now leveling off a little bit, uh, but I put an arrow on 1980 because 1980 was where all of this began. And we can see this internationally as well. International data on trends in overweight in adults and children both show that beginning in about 1980 and whatever countries are evaluated, the prevalence of obesity has started to rise and is continuing to rise. So, um, as I said, I was in Mexico a couple of weeks ago, and in Mexico, obesity is a relatively new problem since 1980. Uh, according to the article that this came from, widespread since the 1980s, with the introduction of processed food into much of the, of the Mexican food market. 
Um, and obesity, the prevalence of obesity in Mexico uh, is said to be leading to a very large health and economic burden. That's not too surprising. The estimate is that 70% of the Mexican population is overweight or obese, and 15% um, are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, which is an extraordinarily high percentage, probably the highest in the world. Um, and that is why Mexico is so interested in trying to take societal approaches to doing something to reduce the risk for obesity, and they've picked on soft drinks as a target. Um, Mexico has the highest proportion of, or the highest amount of soft drink uh, consumption in the world, second only to the United States and that is highly correlated with its high prevalence of obesity. Um, I picked up this poster in Mexico because uh, I was kind of astounded. I'd never seen a three-liter soda bottle before. And you can buy a three-liter bottle of Pepsi or Coke for 17 pesos, which is the equivalent of about a dollar and a quarter, and that's cheaper than bottled water in Mexico. Part of that has to do with the fact that Mexico is a cane sugar producing country and their sugar, which is not subject to the kind of tariffs and quotas that ours is, is much cheaper than sugars in the United States. Um, what the idea that Mexico would be taxing sodas uh, has elicited an extraordinary amount of lobbying. Um, the soda industry is in Mexico in exactly the same way that it was in New York City over the soda cap, something I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, and one of the things that the advocacy groups in Mexico are finding out is that even though they have produced some dramatic advertisements to um, support the soda tax, those advertisements are not allowed to be shown on national television in Mexico because the television stations don't want to lose their soda advertising. Um, so let's talk about the risks of obesity. If this were just a cosmetic problem, we wouldn't care about it. Uh, but obesity carries with it several kinds of risks. Health risks, of course. Some percentage of obese and overweight people are going to uh, increase their risk for health problems. There are risks of treatment, and there are very, very high costs associated with it. Uh, on a worldwide basis. Uh, diabetes is probably the most obvious example. Rates of diabetes have increased in parallel with the prevalence of obesity, and diabetes trends worldwide track very, very closely with worldwide trends in obesity, again, starting in the 1980s. The medical costs of obesity in billions of dollars in the United States alone are estimated at roughly 150 or more billion dollars a year. And then if you add in the costs of drugs and of bariatric surgery, the estimates are 160 to 450 billion dollars a year. I don't know how you pick a number out of that. The spread seems kind of wide. But I think we can all agree that obesity is very expensive not only for individuals but also for for society. So we need to talk about pre prevention. <laughs> Preventing obesity is really easy. All you have to do is eat less, eat better, and move more. And please don't eat my book. Um, and if it seems more complicated than that, it is surely because of the effect of the eat less advice on the food industry. And this was beautifully described by a Coca-Cola executive in 2007 who told Advertising Age that obesity had become the Achilles heel of the a discussion about obesity and of the food industry. It used to be something they didn't have to pay any attention to, and now it's something they have to deal with every single day of their working lives. That was in 2007. At the end of 2012, Coca-Cola Coca and, and all corporations have to file reports to the Security and Exchange Commission in which they uh, disclose the risks in society and in business that might affect their profits. 
And in two, at the end of 2012, Coca-Cola listed as its number one risk factor obesity. Obesity, Coca-Cola said, may reduce demand for its products. The public health officials are very worried about obesity and its consequences, particularly among young people, and are advising people to eat, drink less soda. Uh, and that is a business risk from their standpoint, a very serious one. And it is indeed a serious one. So let's talk about what happened starting in 1980. I've mentioned 1980 several times. And it seems to me that we can that we could do a little historical perspective on this and go back to 1980 and say, what happened in 1980 that made the prevalence of obesity rise? Well, obesity is about physical activity, and it's about um, calories in and calories out. And I'm not going to say very much about physical activity. Um, this tells it all, uh, except to say that there is very little evidence that physical activity has changed very much from 1980 to the present. Um, there, the data on physical activity are from, pub, are from reports. The data are not very good. Um, but what data we do have suggest that there is very, very little change, not enough of a change to account for rising, the rising prevalence of overweight. But there is plenty of evidence that people are eating more now than we did in 1980. And that there are two sources of data for that. I'm only going to show one of them. This is calories in the food supply, the number of calories that are available, less exports plus imports. For <clears throat> about 80 years in the United States, the number of calories available per capita, every man, woman, and child in the United States, was 3,200 plus or minus a couple of hundred calories. Starting in 1980, it went up to 3,900 calories a day, an increase of 700, even if, as the Department of Agriculture maintains, uh, a thousand of these calories are wasted. It's still a great abundance of calories and an increase in calories. And that increase made the food industry extraordinarily competitive. 3,900 calories a day per capita is roughly twice average need, if you include little tiny babies. Um, and so that makes the food industry very competitive to try to sell that food. Uh, but that wasn't all. The second thing that happened in the early 1980s, or, 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 or the cause of all of that, was deregulation of agriculture. Uh, agriculture used to be regulated in a way that required farmers to leave land fallow um, and conserve land so that the cost of food would stay high, would stay higher. It was deregulated in the 1970s, and farmers were given support payments to grow as much food as they possibly could, and they did, and that's why calories in the food supply went up. Um, and then and the second thing that happened was deregulation of Wall Street in the early 1980s. Wall Street shifted from um, evaluating companies on the basis of long-term, slow returns on investment to a system that gave higher returns on investment immediately. It was called the shareholder value movement. It's attributed to a speech given by Jack Welch, who was head of General Electric in 1981. And following that, Wall Street began to insist that companies report not only profits to Wall Street, but growth in profits every 90 days. Uh, so this put enormous pressure on food companies to expand their sales constantly. And as a result of, and we see the result of that, I think. And they were given one break, and that was deregulation of marketing, which occurred when President Reagan came in in 1980. And there was an enormous deregulation of marketing so that um, companies were able to market directly to children and market in ways that they hadn't been able to do before. And the marketing is interesting. I, it's very hard to get figures on marketing, but Advertising Age, once a year, publishes an issue in which they give some specific figures. 
The current bill for food, beverage, and restaurant marketing in the United States is $16 billion a year, and that is just for the amount of money that goes, of advertising that goes through advertising agencies where it can be counted. There's also other kinds of marketing. And if you look at the uh, marketing figures for specific products, uh, Coca-Cola spent $267 million in to, um, 2011 just for classic Coke, not any of the other Coca-Cola products, just that one. PepsiCo spent $113 million on Gator, to market Gatorade just Gatorade, and then $42 million for Frosted Flakes, $51 for Pop-Tarts, and so forth. These are staggering amounts of money in public health terms. Very, very difficult for any advocacy group or public health agency to counter that level of money spent on one product. Um, the other thing that happened in the early 1980s was that um, one of the ways in which food companies could sell more food was to make bigger portions. The cost of food was very low in comparison to labor and other costs, and so they could make bigger portions. People loved them because they're a bargain, and sell them at a very handsome profit, and the sizes of everything went up. And if I had one thing that, as a public health nutritionist, that I could teach the world, it would be that larger portions have more calories. <laughs> um, Believe me, it is not intuitively obvious, and there's plenty of evidence that shows that it's not. So people think that if it comes in a container, uh, it, has, it, it has the same number. It has 100 calories if it comes in a container of any size. Um, and then because there was so much food available, farmers were growing so much food, the prices stayed low. And because of our bizarre agricultural support system, uh, you can go to McDonald's with $5 roughly and buy five hamburgers or one salad. So that's kind of weird, but that's the way our support system works. And then if poor people think that fruits and vegetables are expensive and complain that they're too expensive to buy, it's because they are more expensive. And Department of Commerce data shows that starting in, the 19, that starting in 1980, the, using 1980 as the index year, the cost of fresh fruits and vegetables has increased by 40%, whereas the cost of beer, butter, and sodas has gone down by 15 to 30%. So it's cheaper to buy junk food than it is to buy fresh fruits and vegetables. So all in all, this creates a marketing environment in which the food industry plus the government plus everything else that's going on creates an environment that encourages people to eat more than is either good for them or good for society. Um, so these were the kinds of issues that made um, David Ludwig, who's a pediatrician in Boston, and I write an article for the Journal of the American Medical Association in which we asked a rhetorical question, can the food industry play a constructive role in the obesity epidemic? We were dubious. Um, and we were dubious because the goals of industry are to make a profit. Um, I mean, it's not that they're evil entities. It's that's their job, is to make a profit and grow that profit every 90 days, whereas public health goals may be quite different from that. Um, so that sort of sets up the, um, the problem that, create, that we're faced with. So in this kind of food environment in which food companies must grow their profits every 90 days, um, eating less and eating better is really, really difficult. It just doesn't have a chance in this kind of environment. So um, obviously what you need to do is you need to change the environment and start eating out of a different parking lot. Um, so the question is how to go about doing that. And the American Heart Association last year published this really interesting article in which they evaluated all of the methods that are currently being tried in order to reduce 
to make it to change the environment in order to make it easier for people to um, eat less and eat better. And so here's the list. Some of them are educational, menu labels, media campaigns, color-coded food labels. All of these have been tried and have been shown to have some effect. Um, restrictions on fast foods and sodas in schools and on marketing to kids. Um, on TV time, the pedi pediatricians say if you're worried about childhood obesity, you turn off the TV. Um, some kind of regulation of portion sizes, that's where the 16-ounce soda cap comes in. Bans on trans fat, that's a heart disease prevention measure. Getting rid of toys with kids' meals. Uh, tax policies and subsidy policies. And all of these have some research behind them, not a lot, but some, much of it preliminary, and that gets us from science right into politics. Um, so let me talk about Mayor Bloomberg's 16 proposal for 16 uh, cap on sodas at 16 ounces, which he announced in May of 2012 um, to... Uh, an enormous uh, kickback. Got a lot of opposition to that. Uh, Bloomberg based the 16-ounce soda cap on um, a really uh, inc uh, an enormously uh, increasing body of research that indicates a correlation between uh, sugary drink consumption and obesity. And there's more and more and more research on that coming out. Um, he also based it on reports that sugars in liquid form are more difficult to, for the body to handle appropriately than um, sugars in, that come in other kinds of forms, and a lot of concern that much of sugary drink marketing is aimed at minorities and low-income populations who are most at risk for obesity. Uh, so there's plenty of evidence about that. Um, it also grew out of a series of public health campaigns that took place in New York City from 2010 to 2012, focused on soda consumption and the amount of sugar that's in sodas. So your kid just ate 26 pounds, packs of sugar in one of these large sugary drinks, um, if you eat a lot of sugar, it's going to turn into fat in the body. And if you want to walk it off, you're going to have to walk from Union Square to Brooklyn to walk off the number of calories in a 20-ounce a soda. And then uh, one focused on portion size, uh, showing somebody who was supposed to have, supposedly with type 2 diabetes, and showing that if you drink large sodas, you're going to be at risk of amputations. How... Uh, Effective these campaigns were, I do not know, but they were all over the place in the subways. Um, he also based it on, uh, picked 16 ounces because the 16 ounce soda was sort of in the middle of what's available. And in the 1950s, he had advertisements that showed that a 16 ounce soda was considered big. Um, and that if you poured it over ice, it would serve three people. During the period that the 16-ounce soda cap was supposed to go into effect, Coca-Cola advertised the 16 ounces small. So that's an indication of how our perception of portion size has changed. Small is big news. All of a sudden, 16 ounces small. Um, so that's a difference in perception and pretty hard to uh, to reverse. So I want to talk a little about what the soda industry did in New York City because I got to observe it personally. First of all, there were full page ads in the New York Times defending the soda industry's self-regulation and saying that this kind of approach was absolutely unnecessary because they were already taking care of it. Then they attacked the science. Um, and they have their own science that they pay for that says that sodas have nothing to do with obesity, and they cited those kinds of studies. And then they attacked the critic. This is a famous ad that was paid for by the Center for Consumer Freedom, an attack dog for the National Restaurant Association. Um, and when Bloomberg, was at, Bloomberg, who has a sense of humor, was asked about this ad at a press conference, and he said, Oh, no, I would never wear a dress like that. It's so unflattering. <laughs> you know. The um, 
what I personally witnessed was this extraordinary outpouring of lobbying and um, and media relations in order to get people in New York to oppose the soda cap. Don't let bureaucrats tell you what size beverage to buy. Um, so this was a matter of your personal freedom. I picked out my beverage all by myself, the T-shirt says. Um, and the person with the T-shirt is carrying a petition and asking people to sign petitions to oppose the soda cap. And my research assistant went out and interviewed these people and asked them how much money they were being paid. And they were being paid $30 an hour to do this. Not bad, huh? Um, so, And they did social media, radio and TV ads, airplane banners, movie trailers. I got a personal mailing to my home. Uh, which means they send 8 million personal mailings to people in, in New York City. I don't have a clue how much money was spent on this. I would give anything to know that. But it wasn't an election, so they didn't have to report the amount of spending. Um, but we do know from um, some soda tax elections that the soda industry is willing to spend a lot of money to defeat these things. And in 2009, when New York State was proposing a soda tax, tax, the Coca-Cola, the PepsiCo, and its trade association, the American Beverage Association, uh, together went from about $3 million a year in lobbying expenses to $40 million uh, in just that one year. So they were willing to spend a, a, a large amount of money to defeat that. They did defeat it. And of course, those of you who have followed the Richmond tax initiatives know that at the end, the soda industry spent $2.2 million to defeat the soda tax in Richmond, as opposed to a mere 25000 spent by the pro-tax forces. They were outspent by 87 to 1. Um, so no wonder they lost. Uh, when all else fails, and this, uh, the soda cap was still making its way and was actually going to go into effect, the soda industry took the Bloomberg administration to court, and the decision yesterday to allow an appeal um, is uh, very heartening to the Bloomberg administration and to the health department, uh, which have not yet given up. You know, so it may still come to pass. Now, why is the soda industry willing to put this kind of money into uh, defeating something that really isn't going to change the price of soda by very much? Um, and I think the answer is here. Um, we're not drinking soda in the United States anymore. Uh, sodas are flat. Young people are not drinking sodas. They have a really bad name. Consequently, the soda industry has had to move its marketing overseas, uh, which is where we get into global kinds of things. So here's PepsiCo, um, which, and I, I've been collecting these for a long time. I'll just show you a few examples. Profits almost doubled on overseas beverage sales. Um, a fistful of dollars, Coke pumps $3 billion into India. India has 1.2 billion people and they're not drinking enough Coke. <laughs> we'll fix that. Uh, and in other countries, PepsiCo and Suntory unite to crack Vietnam's beverage markets. Let's get sodas into places where they've never seen them before. One of the ways that they're doing that is by making little teeny sodas that just give people a taste so they're getting hooked on it. And of course, it's very associated with um, everything that's great about America. So these will be very, very difficult to deal with, and you should expect that obesity will follow very, very closely behind, as it already is. Now, what's interesting to me about it is the soda industry is making a big push to try to show that they are part of the solution to problems of worldwide malnutrition um, and are not part of the problem of obesity, and they have placed articles in uh, professional journals, public health journals, arguing that yes, the food industry can help tackle the, the growing global burden of undernutrition, and if you want to improve child health in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, you um, market vitamins through sodas. On the other hand, public health advocates have argued very forcefully uh, that this is ridiculous, and no, the soda industry is part, really is part of the problem. And I was interested to see 
this article in BMJ saying that Nestle, no relation, and PepsiCo will give nutritional advice to women in an anti-hunger campaign in Mexico. And that caused a Mexican journal to publish this uh, cartoon of their social welfare um, minister saying, are you hungry? Take Pepsi. Um, and that, so as if Pepsi is going to solve all of the nutrition problems in Mexico. Um, so uh, where I come down on this is that if we're going to deal with over and under nutrition, we need to advocate for a level of personal responsibility, voting with your, what I call voting with your fork, in which we encourage people to eat food, not products, smaller portions if they're worried about obesity, uh, focus on local and sustainable food, um, grow food, grow their own food, cook at home, and teach kids how to cook. That's the most radical thing you can do. On the other hand, we also need to advocate global social responsibility, and that gets us into highfalutin uh, concepts of sustainability and social justice and democracy. And that's why I think that Mexico's efforts to tax soda are the first step in organizing social democracies around these kinds of issues and opposing lobbying efforts that have never been seen at any kind of rate like this before. Uh, and um, those, these are the kinds of things that I discuss in the book that I hope they have out there. Eat, Drink, Vote, the cartoons that I showed you are from it, um, and the final cartoon. Um, which I adore, obviously, is uh, vote with your fork and even better, vote with your vote. Thank you very much for letting me come and speak to you. Um, how